a professor at MIT gave a talk in 2016 explaining how companies like Netflix and Hulu, ones we're familiar with, could rebuild their platforms again using blockchain to power them underneath. It's cool, right? But what about your life and your bank account? How about your identity? The professor said our widespread concerns about identity theft could be out the window when it comes to blockchain. Our identity is usually tied to something as simple uh, as a secret or social security number. Hey, you know how weak that link is. Blockchain can track our attributes, what we can do or not do in the economy, in a much more transparent and potentially more secure way. Of course, then there's more, you know, looking, looking forward five, 10 years, you can think about IP, new forms of intellectual property, smart contracts, internet of things, so device kind of bartering and exchanging resources, your car going on the highway and kind of buying up lane space, depending on how fast you need to get to work. Uh, but all of those applications are, are far from here. Social security number to your morning commute. That is a lot, all on blockchain. Professor Christian Catalini teaches blockchain at MIT, one of the top technology institutions in the world. He took a few minutes to talk with me about some burning questions I still had when it comes to the structure and the security of blockchain. Professor Catalini, did you ever imagine blockchain would garner so much attention? I think in the last few uh, years, what we've seen is really a transition from blockchain and cryptocurrency uh, as being only one thing as being potentially many different things and many different types of digital platforms. So no, I, I didn't expect it to accelerate at, at this pace. I was optimistic, but not to this extent. What kinks out there still exist that you think have to be worked out before blockchain, the technology, goes more mainstream? A lot of the issues around scaling, around how to make the technology actually useful to users, how to make it user friendly, are some of the big unknowns. And then, of course, regulation. Uh, how will this integrate with the financial system as we know it today uh, and with everything we do uh, on a daily basis? Right now, it seems like if there is a sequential element to all of this and someone somehow snipped one of the chains, and again, I'm a lay person, but this is my understanding, that it could disrupt everything flowing back and forth. Um, are there any ways to prevent something like that at this point? So it's important to remember that what makes a, you know, a blockchain or a distributed ledger secure is not so much the, the computer science or the, this kind of immutable audit trail. It's really all about incentives. Um, as, as, a, you know, as a collective, uh, when, when we are updating data, when we're maintaining data on a blockchain, we're essentially forming what people have called internet level consensus. Um, so w what makes this technology special is that it's a new way to coordinate economic activity across the globe uh, without using some of the technologies that we had in the past. Are there any sort of preemptive measures being taken to make sure that one sort of scam could not overtake someone's entire life? From a purely cybersecurity perspective, you know, what, what could be invaluable is being able to, to verify that a system has been tampered with in the first place. And so I think you'll see more and more applications where we bring in the technology to make it more expensive for an attacker uh, to not only attack, but also to, to go undetected for a long period of time. What else do you see coming over the horizon that excites you and excites your students? Instead of talking about specific applications, the way I like to think about it is like there's almost like a technology arc. We started from things that were purely digital, where everything was recorded on a distributed ledger like in Bitcoin, and we're moving to things that have some sort of physical presence. Uh, think about computation with Ethereum. So computation, there's a CPU or a GPU or some, some machine in the background running those calculations for you. Uh, and now we have experiments around file storage. So there's a number of startups and open source communities trying to link storage, data file storage, uh, to a blockchain so that we can trade it very much like any other commodity. Hmm. So we're going from things that are, again, bits uh, to things that have some physical presence in the real world. Uh, think about electricity. Electricity is almost digital, but then you have to meter it. Uh, to be able to transact on it. Uh, and so I think over time, you'll see more and more services that bridge the gap of what we call the last mile. So that interface between the offline world and a digital blockchain. We have spent some time tonight in the theoretical, in the future. Now let's talk about today, the practical. What will the effect be on us? What is already happening right now? Professor Catalini, the man you just heard from, he published a paper recently predicting some of the blockchain effects on the places we buy and sell every day. It's scholarly but you're gonna get the gist. Quote, 
The resulting marketplaces are characterized by increased competition, lower barriers to entry and innovation, lower privacy and censorship risk, and allow participants within the same ecosystem to make investments to support and operate shared infrastructure without assigning market power to a platform operator. All right, his enthusiasm there, peeking right around the dense wording, but again, it's a scholarly paper. In short, things will get easier and cheaper.